Good morning, everyone. Um, for the next sort of half an hour, I'm going to do a talk, and it's, uh, as you can see, entitled From Shopkeeping to Thrill Seeking, Why Bricks and Mortar Retail Needs to Become More Rock and Roll. So hopefully we'll have a bit of fun through this half an hour. Think of any uh, challenging questions uh, for the last sort of five minutes. Um, so think on the way through. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alistair Lennox. I'm the Executive Creative Director at Fitch, which is a design consultancy. Next June is my, uh, my 20th year anniversary at, at Fitch Design. Let me just take one minute to introduce Fitch Design. We position ourselves as the world leading brand and retail design consultancy. 15 studios, as you can see, all the, all the kind of classic places on the dots on the map. Um, I've obviously, I'm British and I've spent most of my working life living and working in London, traveling east. And as of the last few weeks, I'm now here in New York City. So I'm, I'm the new boy in town. So treat, <laughs> treat me carefully. Uh, so those are our, our Fit Studios. What do we do? Well, I think about half our work is working for classic retailers and half of our work is working for brands who generally present their product services in retail. A lot of names that you'll, uh, you'll recognize there. In New York City, we've, over the last sort of 15, 18 months, we've opened new experiences for uh, Ford in the Oculus, which is what, only what, 10, 15 minute walk away from here. The first sort of um, Ford brand experience is called the Ford Hub, worth going to. There's no physical car in it. Uh, we've also opened uh, a new Lowe's DIY store in, uh, up in Chelsea and up in Soho, Perch, which is a super high-end um, uh, 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 high end consumer electronics store that's um, really revolutionary. So those are a couple of kind of touch points in, in the city that you'll uh, that you could go to visit if you like. There's a couple of these case studies I'll pick up today, um, and I will unpack them around music. So let me make a start. No more about Fitch, I promise. Uh, I just want to tell you kind of a personal story of my my passion of music. And it's a lifelong passion of music how I consume it, how I enjoy it, and how I buy it. So this is my first ever music single, the first track I ever bought. It was 1979. I don't know if anybody remembers this. You're all probably too young. <laughs> and it's the specials, special AKA, Too Much Too Young, and it was on a 45 uh, uh, vinyl. That was my first ever vinyl music track. Uh, maybe the next year, two years later, I was starting to buy blank cassette tapes and creating my own little magic mixes, rude boy mixtapes, being creative. Uh, seems like a long time ago now. By 1982, I bought my very first compact disc, and it was this album, a seminal album from The Jam, which transpired to be their last musical uh, album together before they blew up and exploded, but it was my first ever CD. So you're starting to see how I'm consuming music in different ways. Then came along Napster. I'm sure you all remember Napster, and it felt super exciting at the time. Downloading, very sluggishly downloading music tracks to very early day PCs. And it felt so exciting because it, it felt naughty, because it was illegal, and we were like cheating the system, and it, it was free music. And it felt super exciting at the time. But as we all know with Napster, it kind of crashed and burned and um, got pushed out of... Um, business, what in the early noughties. Clearly this great man came along and got people like me paying for music again with the very first iPod and um, iTunes. Fast forward maybe another 10, 15 years and then I went into another phase of not wanting to pay for music again and, and sort of streaming music through uh, products like Spotify and others. And I was probably being a bit too cheap that I wasn't subscribing and I started to get super uh, annoyed by all the adverts on the freemium and not going upgrading. So probably about 15 months ago, I made another step back into buying music when I now subscribe to Apple Music. And you know, not everybody likes it, it's, it's kind of my choice. Um, and it's brilliant, you know, it, it has all my back catalog. It, it, it surprises me with new tracks. It's a genius algorithm that kind of drops in the latest track, surprises me with some new things, comforts me with some, uh, some old tracks. And it's just super, super convenient. And so now I don't actually have any physical music. I don't have anything physical or, or tactile. I don't, they've all gone off to the loft or gone off to the charity shops. All my music is now rented, intangible, and it you know, very seamlessly streams around my house or in my car, through my headphones, 
and it's just simple, one click and every month to pay, and it downloads gorgeously. So what that really kind of gets to, very sadly, is that um, I no longer go to record stores or music stores. And like this sad one, they, they've, a lot of them have been closing down. Now, I do appreciate there's been a little peak in middle-aged men buying uh, vinyl albums again, but to a great extent, record stores have really struggled. And I particularly like that image. You can see Ziggy Stardust uh, fly poster there. So you're probably wondering, what does that mean to brands? Well, I actually feel that my relationship uh, with shopping, buying other stuff, is quite similar to that story that I've just told you with my relationship with music. So let me try and make sense of that. Very old photograph. Everything was black and white in the 70s in sepia. Um, so my first shopping expeditions were probably going to my local village uh, with my mum, going to a bakery store, going into the baker, and the baker would know my mum by first name. Uh, he would know exactly what she wanted as she walked in the door. He would also kind of second guess what she might be wanted as well, and she might might surprise her with something she didn't think she wanted as well. So if you like, it was like a modern-day algorithm before, before the algorithms. And what it was also, the shopkeeper was kind. He had a smile. He was generous. And that was my very first sort of shopping experience. And I imagine for a lot of us, quite similar. When I started to get a young teenager, I would go into our nearest town and uh, go into sort of independent shops like this. Maybe bought that... Uh, maybe bought those mixtapes that I was starting to get creative with. And kind of messy and still uh, owned by one, one passionate person who ran that particular store. Then maybe on a few years, I would have been buying that CD I talked about, that very first CD, and I would be going to my nearest city, big bad city, where I would have met organized retail for the first time. So in the UK, HMV, uh, His Majesty's Voice, it's uh, a, a chain uh, music store that has come back uh, from the dead over the last few years. And in there, I would have bought the uh, CD. But you know what? Even if I went there every day, the staff, the store manager would never know who I am. So that's when you start to realize that you have a very cold relationship with, um, with chain stores as opposed to independent. My very first trip to the States, so exciting. No surprise, it was New York City. And I walked into, not this particular image, but it was the very first Apple store. And as a young designer, that was like clearly a powerful, seminal moment. And I bought that iPad, uh, sorry, the iPod that I, I showed you earlier. And walking into that, uh, that very sort of uh, early Apple store, it was like, you know, holy shit, there's something really exciting here. I want to be designing experiences like this. So where does that get us to today? Well, I'm kind of traveling a lot, and I'd say nearly all my purchases are probably one, one click. Um, Apple Pri uh, Amazon Prime has been a big part of my life the last couple of years. And in London, I've seen it being delivered in five days to 48 hours to two days to four hours to, you know, it gets to my desk before I've got to, uh, uh, you know, before I've got home. So I'm, this isn't me, but I'm a massively lazy person. So if I can shop at home on the comfort of my sofa in my gorgeous apartment, why the hell would I really want to go to a physical store? Why would I really want to get off that lovely sofa and I could just buy everything through those one-click apps? And it's not just me buying in, the, in my living room. I'm now starting buying stuff in my kitchen. And I realize that this image is now... 48 hours old because there's a new, the new Echo that has the screen in that they announced the other day. So I'm now verbally saying, hey, Alexa, why don't you reorder me those Nespresso capsules and blow me next day. There they are. And it's kind of genius. So shopping, living room, and now in the kitchen. And obviously, it's going to become um, implicit all the way through our houses. So. The parallel there is I'm now no longer going to physical stores, the same as how I buy my music. It's super duper convenient. It's kind of frictionless, but it's quite disconnected. It's not very exciting. And just to flip that back into the music world, albeit I buy my music and I consume it through the latest sort of zeitgeist apps, I actually spend lots of money going to physical spaces to enjoy music, and that's live performance. My greatest passion is going to pubs, going to the back room and seeing bands that we've never seen before, 
going to kind of like iconic music venues. This is uh, Brixton Academy, you must go, which has had some of the best nights of my life there, jumping around, going crazy. And in the summer season, you may recognize it's the pyramid stage of Glastonbury Festival a bit. It maybe costs like $500 to get a ticket for four or five days. It is a life-changing experience. And it's not just a music festival, it's a cultural arts music, uh, music festival. Uh, and somebody pointed out the other day, I'm glad I didn't put up the fire festival here, which has clearly been a, <laughs> a, bit of a bit of a washout. But they're all very different ways that I enjoy live music. And I pay. Maybe I'm paying through the drinks. I'm paying through a ticket. I'm paying through my, my camping pass for four days. I'm paying a lot of money to enjoy and consume live music. And I'm not on my own. Um, you can kind of read the diagram yourself and see where the trajectory is going. But now a very large part of the uh, music industry is, is revenue from live gigs. You know, less on the music uh, sales itself, and that's why bands are out gigging heavily around the world. And uh, are we all all going and experiencing live bands more and more. And that's what really sort of strikes me. M the music industry has brought me back to have a second revenue stream. I buy super seamlessly through my uh, Apple Music, and my second revenue is going to live spaces and having these rich, visceral experiences. And that's really sort of the crux, if you like, the pivot of this talk. It's like, I think it's time for physical retailers to think a little bit more rock and roll, and why? It's to track them back, back in store. Because a lot of people have increasingly not going to stores, and a, a, a comment I hear used quite often is that there's more going to change over the next five years than the last 50 in physical retail, and hopefully I'll be in a small part in, um, in helping design that. So I've kind of broken this talk down into three, three insights, if you like, of three things that these brands and retail owners, what we can learn from live gigs, and what does that mean for the physical experience. The first one is stirring emotions. Now, as I kind of touched on earlier, there's an algorithm for everything to make it seamless, it's super, but there's no algorithm that really stirs your emotion. And I think that's the one thing with live music is it's visceral, it gets deeper, and it really stirs the emotion. It really means something. Uh, I'm just going to play you a little film, which is sort of just a few thoughts from Fitch that kind of frame up the idea of how do we stir emotions and specifically the key eight emotions that us humans all share. And there you can see the eight core human emotions that we all share. And uh, I believe, uh, and Fitch believe, that every brand should try and own one or two of these emotions and that we need to create experiences that create triggers that um, create something more meaningful. Who liked Freddie Mercury? I mean, <laughs> yeah, he's one of the, one of the uh, rock gods, yeah. Uh, many years ago, I think over 15 years ago, he, he made this genius, genius quote. A concert is not a live rendition of our album. It's a theatrical event. And he was just awesome on stage, wasn't he? And that's what I believe the parallel is to the world of, uh, of retail, that you may have the super slickest app and, and uh, e-commerce site 
and it's frictionless and just genius. But why would you want to replicate that in a physical environment? Now, sometimes we do want a super convenient space, but actually, going forward, we want to go to spaces that feel more like a theatrical event where we can stir the emotions and actually create something really kind of visceral and dynamic. It's a lovely quote from, um, from Freddie there. I mean, one of my, okay, I'm feeling a bit old looking at these youngsters in there, but what I love when you're in a, in a live gig, how hot and sweaty and messy it gets. You know, everybody's singing and you kind of, you're running out of voice. And, um, and there's that point when everybody starts to start to jump and sing together. And you may have gone on, on your own independently, but suddenly, like, the group becomes one more than the sum of the parts. And I just think there's something massively powerful around bringing people together in spaces. Now, with retail, that's probably mostly where we spend our time with others is in queues and, you know, only having grumpy things to say. Uh, but there are some great examples, and I'm sure you're aware of some of them. Always big respect to Nike um, and how they, they have their runners clubs on you know, different nights of the week, meet behind the store, bringing people together, social experience, really achieving you know, fitness together. And it's not gratuitously about selling product at all. Probably no quince in the same category of health and lifestyle. Lululemon, the Canadians, and I think you know, in Europe, they've just been an absolute storm how they've integrated into yoga communities and, and sort of uh, the wellness kind of trend. And, and how they, their stores are not shops. They are spaces to meet people and practice yoga together. And I think this is a great example of a space that brings people together to share, to share the same passion. Uh, here we are in your town. It opened last, I think, July, August. The Sonos up in, uh, in uh, Soho. It's brilliant how you, know, you have these six little... Um, music rooms, and you can go in there with just a couple of people. You can listen to music. I was in there one, one day when they were actually making some music in one of the little cubicles. And it's really about giving people places to come together and enjoy their passion around music. So big respect to uh, uh, Sonos for that particular store. What they've also been experimenting with, I think to various degrees of success, is creating something even more sort of uh, subtle and abstract. They're called Sonos Studios. It's an image of one that was in London town. I, 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 someone told me it's closed recently. I mean, I don't feel it was ever set up to be a, a profit center. And essentially, it's a creative workshop, an acoustically uh, created uh, workshop that inspires people to do creative things together. And Sonos and its products are very much abstract and further back than the, um, than the previous image, which is very much sort of a product store around experience. The second um, insight I would like to kind of share from the music industry to bricks and mortar is this idea of think venues, not formats. Retailers have been obsessed by the idea of small, medium, and large, convenience, big, big box, all these different phrases, all around square meterage and how many sales per square meter. I'm actually more excited by this idea of, you know, a quote from someone saying, this is where I'm alive. How do we create passionate venues where people want to go. Uh, some examples, not, not my work, um, but here in London, it's the Burberry store, opened in 2012. If you're ever there, it's absolutely exquisitely designed in an old, uh, old theatre building on Regent Street. Perfect symmetry, detailing quality all the way through. And you can kind of see the mirrors that run around the outside where the, it, you know, it'll, it'll help you buy a $1,000 of uh, raincoat just beautifully. Um, and that's what it's like in the daytime. It's the, the Jekyll and the Hyde is that that space also adapts. And Burberry were ahead of all the, all the curve where they had their very first sort of catwalk show that they broadcast as live through their web. And that store geniusly, if you can recognize it there, the base of the stairs, becomes a live catwalk. It becomes a gig venue. So here, this is Jake Bug, but um, a couple of years ago. Respect for Burberry for that. A um, bit more mass market. Uh, uh, apparel brands like uh, Topshop started to follow on by bringing catwalks into the store. So this would have been the London fashion catwalk. But even at that stage, it was still about VIP 
and uh, very exclusive. So what Topshop did brilliantly well over a number of years, they democratized um, fashion shows. And through all the sort of tricks and technology in VR, they kind of let everybody experience behind stage and give as much access and democratize it. So people around the world could see it live. They could um, create it live through the website, and they could buy direct from the catwalk. So absolutely genius work. And really, I think it, that goes back to the um, Topshop think of their stores as venues, not as um, square footage of retail space. So the image on the left is uh, 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 another British kind of music festival. And what's interesting, all music festivals have very different types of personalities and characters. So the Burning Man to a Coachella to, a, to um, an X and a Y. They all have a very different vibe. On the right is a classic uh, Westfield shopping mall. I know we've got one in the uh, Oculus. Um, and I'm not picking on anywhere in Westfield here. But they certainly have a look and they have a very clean, stripped out kind of vibe. Maybe something interesting happening in the, uh, the atrium in the base. But what if someone like Coachella Festival was actually to create the next shopping mall? I bet you the experience would start to feel very different. Imagine if, I think the daddies of all festivals, Glastonbury Festival, was to take over yours are my nearest sort of shopping mall in my town or city. I bet the choice of brands, the stores, how they would put them together, the hospitality, food and beverage, the events, the day and night, I bet you it would feel completely different if, if a Glastonbury was the curator of, of, of malls and, and kind of retail spaces. And I'm very, very kind of excited by that. You know, imagine if, if they brought in a, a hip hop artist just for one track. Um, just to come in and to put a spin on it, something like that. And I just think there's that kind of interesting collision between sort of culture and commerce here. Continuing on this thought of uh, thinking venues, uh, not formats or retail formats. Here's a store that uh, we opened last year, uh, Fitch Design in Dubai, a long way away. And it's explicitly a luxury children's department store. Um, it had a soft opening about a year ago, and it opened after all the Dubai heat in last uh, November. Had the Cirque du Soleil did a, an amazing performance in the atrium to, to open it. And really, it's all around uh, the insight around children and how they play and how they want to go back. And in every floor, there are different event spaces. There's a, a most gorgeous uh, children's uh, ballet room on the third floor. There are birthday rooms, food and beverage, constantly different kind of... Um, artists and, uh, going around. I appreciate it is a luxury store, uh, but one of the, the highest, um, I think for me, the most pleasant bit here is that the stores actually received numerous handwritten notes from children expressing their love for the store. So I think, albeit this didn't win a One Show Award last night. Yes, sour, very sour. <laughs> We've been receiving some very nice, nice notes from the children, so uh, that makes up for it. But it's, it's really a, a space that was all created absolutely around this idea of think of it as a venue for play as opposed to uh, a retail format and square meters. And finally, the, the third insight is the idea of uh, memory making. Another quote, final quote, take me back to the nights I felt alive. And you know, we've all been to uh, big nights out, music uh, club nights and gigs, and we've come back, we've gone, oh my God, that was an unforgettable experience unforgettable and it's burnt deep into our memories and and it's no accident that they're you know unforgettable because what they've done brilliantly well at those sort of events they've managed the evening generally or the weekend or those two hours and how hopefully you can see it on the image here that's actually um a set list as in the the sequence of music tracks that have been taped to a floor on a on a, on a stage somewhere. And it's, and it's the set list that really manages the energy flow through those 90 minutes, two hours of a live gig. So it'll probably start with a big kind of strong start. There'll be the crowd pleasers that everyone's wanting to hear and sing along to. There'll be some new tracks that we've, you know, experimental new tracks that you've never heard of before. Some you might not like. They'll probably walk on a surprise um, uh, featuring artists for one or two tracks, the acapella. And then at the end, if we're really lucky, everything will build up to a really strong crescendo, lights, smoke machine, pyrotechnics, kabooma. And if we all shout and scream and holler enough, we're really lucky, they'll let 
uh, the artists come back in for an encore, like the icing on the cake. Yeah. And that is by no accident that um, they've managed the time, those 90 minutes, by creating a roller coaster of emotions. And that's really uh, what we do at Fitch. We, very simple diagram of low to high pleasure and time. We create customer journeys where we absolutely define what is the high emotional peak and what is this strong end. Very much how I've just described a music event. And we actually plan those in to our customer journeys into our design. And these peaks, or if you like, are the, the experience signature. I won't go into this in detail, but really, uh, you can download it on SlideShare. It's all around how physical spaces are actually the best place to have the highest emotional intensities, and, uh, as opposed to online. There's a lot of kind of data that backs there up. We need to also have a better end to the experience. Uh, if you can just see that queuing and payment process is the real pain point, and that's what everybody hates. And there's loads of technology now where I can actually now check out in fitting rooms, uh, click and pay, uh, click and go. And that's really going to really reduce the pain at the end. Final film. That design was very much created around that customer journey of thinking of what are those two emotional peaks, those ownable moments. And the first is when people step into the color cloud you'd have seen and they start to learn and be educated around color theory and how to decorate young uh, middle class uh, Indians. And the second at the end is how they can take away their own my color, bit of brochure, bit an online, bit on the app, and they take it away for the next purchase. So very much about two emotional peaks in that particular journey. So to conclude, uh, this is kind of my view on uh, retail. It needs to be live, and um, things need to be more unexpected, and this idea of constant new is the future of physical retail. And I think there are two, two responsibilities. If you're a brand owner, if you work in brands or retail, you need to think of retail needs to be more live, kick-ass, sweaty, messy, and highly commercial. And shopkeepers need to become more thrill seekers and branch it out more like rock bands. And my responsibility as a creative is to be less of a stage designer, what's the interior the design, the architecture, but it's actually to be the conductor, the audiovisual artist, the filmmaker, the pyrotechnician, the choreographer, all in one. And that's our responsibility to create these highly emotional, uh, visceral retail stores of the future. So with that, can't leave without a Bowie. Rock on, thank you very much. <laughs>